Hey guys, before we start today, I want to take a moment to thank our devoted Patreon supporters. We really can't express to you all just how much it means to us that you would share your hard-earned money in order to support us here at Subjectively, but for now we'll just say thanks. If you got some extra cash and would like to help the channel continue to grow, consider joining as a patron. The link is down in the description. Thank you all again, now let's get on with the video. What's up guys, we're back, and I know it's been a while since we last saw each other. We've been pretty busy over here between finalizing the Apoctober story and artwork, conceptualizing new ideas for the Maza region, professional client work for big companies, and private freelance work commissions I get through Instagram. I've been kind of swamped. But as I was working on the commission work I received from private clients, I realized that it's been a long time since I shared on YouTube my process for what is arguably my most recognizable work, the Pokemon armor sets. I've done a ton of these videos in the past, and if you guys haven't seen them already, you can scrub through them quickly to get an idea of just how much my process and overall methods of illustrations have changed over time. I've sort of entered what I'm considering to be a new series in this collection of Pokemon armor sets. I've evolved a lot as an artist since I last opened commissions, and how I draw and conceptualize my work has changed dramatically. The main things I'm doing differently since the last video are as follow. Number one, the art pose model. In other videos, you'll see me tracing over 3D human anatomy models that I was posing using an app called Art Pose. This saved me some time, as I could skip an underdrawing and just use these models for my base anatomy and layer armor over them. However, there were really only two body types available to me in Art Pose, male and female. This was incredibly limiting, and restricting myself to just idealized adult male and female bodies took a lot of personality out of each design. I also found myself becoming lazier with every piece, as skipping my initial sketching phase, while it did save me time, also detracted a lot from my creative process. Number two, characterization. In my previous armor sets, the majority of the designs had no exposed human faces. They were often wearing masks, helmets, or hoods that obscured a large part of the head. Furthermore, the poses that I used in art pose were often stiff, like a mannequin, and the 8x11 ratio canvas that I was drawing on yielded the same overall shape of the character in each design. Going forward, I would like to bring more life into each character, less of an armor set that anyone could wear, and more of a human version of the Pokémon wearing armor to reflect that Pokémon's physical design. You might argue that these aren't even really Pokémon armors anymore, I guess they're more like turning Pokémon into human characters, but that's just not as grabby. How the Pokémon would translate into a human and behave in human form will play a bigger role in these designs. Number 3. Color and Rendering You may recall my signature prism painting style that I used for most of my Series 1 Pokémon armor sets. This was a way for me to explore color, light, and contrast through digital media. It was very much in my comfort zone. I'm kind of an artist who likes crisp lines and sharp edges. My new form of color rendering is not entirely different, but once again is less limiting and I find it works better with more expressive designs that I use in this series. You'll notice some other changes to formatting and overall composition, but the ones that I discussed will be the most recognizable. Anyway, I won't go on for too much longer about all of this, let's just take a look at some of the new series for ourselves. Enjoy the four newest Instagram commissioned armored sets. Okay, well actually <laughs> this first one wasn't commissioned. This was one that I did for free for one of my friend's birthdays. They had asked for a Charmander, and it was actually at this point that I decided I was going to be done with tracing the art pose models. I, I really couldn't picture a humanoid Charmander character being anything other than a little kid. Up until this point, only a few people had commissioned unevolved Pokémon for the armor sets, so more often than not, an adult character made sense for the design. Charmander, though, it felt like it needed to be depicted as a young child. Still powerful in their own right, but maybe not as tall <laughs> as some of my other designs. The anatomy that I sketched out initially had the proportions of a smaller human, which in turn allowed for more variation in the actual design of the armor. Charmander really only has three colors in its design orange, yellow, and blue, and very few adornments and patterns within the silhouette of the Pokémon itself. I improvised a bit, incorporating its pale yellow stomach on a set of baggy overalls, and turning Charmander's most iconic feature, its ignited tail, into a long braid. I wanted this character to feel like a strong, determined, and overambitious young apprentice. She's still learning the skills of both sword fighting and honing her inherent magical ability, but she's a little careless, hence the bandages and misfitting overall straps. 
This piece really felt like the beginning of a new era for my Pokemon armors, and I was excited to move forward from here. The next Pokemon was commissioned by a fan on Instagram who wanted to see Empoleon transformed into a human design. Empoleon is one of those Pokemon that I forget about a lot, but then I see it and I'm like, oh yeah, that guy's cool. This client had a very specific vision for this design. They wanted their Empoleon to take after the late Napoleon Bonaparte, which I actually think makes a lot of sense for this Pokemon. Once again, I didn't limit myself to a pre-made human body model. Instead, I referenced a portrait of Napoleon himself. While he may not be as short as everyone remembers him to be, he's definitely a little pudgy, and it actually matched Empoleon's body shape pretty closely. It kind of worked out perfectly. <laughs> I wanted him to have the same sort of balance between military uniform and old school western royalty that was so popular in the 1800s, and of course, he needed a crown. His crown helmet was really the only part of this design that you could technically call armor. The rest of the design was just a coat, trouser, and very elaborate shoes. But I think I did justice to Empoleon as a Pokemon and captured that sense of aloof superiority that the initial design projects. Also, he has a cane for hitting subordinates, and a decorative sword just for looking cool. The last two armor sets in this video were commissioned by the same client, the first of which was to be based off of Mega Blaziken and designed using influence from the historical figure Takeda Shingen. Takeda was a Japanese feudal era lord from the 16th century, and is famous for his rivalry with a man named Usugi Kenshin. Like all historical figures, his true identity has become skewed by indulgent and exaggerated depictions of how he might have looked in his time, but he is mostly recognized today in full samurai armor, sporting a fearsome menpo with a bushy mustache, and brandishing a gunbai, or a Japanese war fan. Combining this somewhat mythical appearance with Mega Blaziken was actually easier than I thought it would be. I reference a specific piece of artwork depicting Takeda as he orders his army using the gun by, but I gave the whole pose a more dramatic flair as if he was attacking with it like a weapon, rather than sitting and pointing with it. Mega Blaziken, which is already very humanoid, also has a mask-like face and large tufts of decorative feathers, which I could easily convert into something that looked like a very decorative headdress. And to capture the iconic fire wrists of the Pokemon, I gave the armor design a pair of hypersaturated red silk tassels that hung from each wrist. This not only made the design look more like Mega Blaziken, but also added more movement to the piece as a whole.
The second piece that this client commissioned was to be based off of Takeda's rival, Usagi Kenshin. The Pokemon inspiration point was Ash Greninja, which I thought was just so funny. Mega Blaziken and Ash Greninja really feel like the quintessential 10-year-old boy Pokemon. Their designs are just so marketable and they're so obviously designed with the younger audiences in mind. They work very well together. Anyway, Usugi Kenshin was also a samurai, and like Takeda Shinjen, has been depicted in many different ways over the years. Conveniently, he's also associated with the color blue, whereas Takeda is often depicted wearing red. I was considering how these two pieces would look in one composition, so having their high contrast red and blue color schemes worked out perfectly. I also posed them facing each other, squaring off as if about to battle. My main goal for the Greninja piece was to make sure that it read enough as Ash Greninja without having to throw that big water shuriken on the back. Between the pink tongue scarf that is arguably the Pokemon's most recognizable feature, the black bead necklace that the client specifically requested, and the intricate mask, the design became very busy very quickly, and adding the water shuriken would have surely just confused it further. I was happy with it in the end, but I think I like the Blaziken armor better. Alright, that wraps up this, the first of my second series of Pokemon armor designs. Which one did you guys like best out of this batch? Let me know down in the comments. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Like I said, we're taking it slow this month, but I promise we'll be getting you back that content that you've all been waiting for as soon as we can. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you all in the next video.